Hey guys, this is uh, Steli Afti with Close.io. Um, welcome you to the SaaS sales strategy webinar. Super excited to talk about um, a bunch of things that we've learned working with hundreds of startups in the SaaS space, helping them define their sales strategy, seeing what works and doesn't, um, and kind of share out of that broad pool of knowledge that we have the, the do's and don'ts and some really best practices. Um, the presentation is going to be around 20 to 30 minutes, and then um, you know we're going to be able to go into Q&A mode. Um, make sure to write down any questions you have while we're going through the slides so that at the end of the presentation, uh, we can take the time and answer all your questions. All right, so let's uh, jump right into it. Um, first thing I wanted to talk about, since this is SaaS, I'm assuming most uh, or all products are you know software as a service, so self-sign-up products to some degree where your users can find you on your website and then sign up for a product or the service. Um, usually that comes with a trial period. So most SaaS products actually empower their users to try out the product before they actually commit to buying it um, and subscribing to it long term. Um, the number one thing that I want to say to get things started with is that you should keep your trials short, short and sweet. Um, and there are exceptions to this rule, but but those exceptions are very, very few. So if you have a product that has real lock-in, where the longer the user is using your product, the more dramatically difficult it is for the user to leave your product, um, then you want trials that are much longer. But there's just so few examples of products that actually accomplish that successfully. Uh, Evernote or Dropbox are maybe just the, the two examples that I can think of at the top of my mind where Actually, the longer you use them, the more locking you have. So it makes total sense for these products to give you a very long trial, or in some cases to have a, a free version that allows you to kind of use up to a certain uh, point and then lock you into an upgraded paid plan. 99% um, of all SaaS products out there uh, don't have that advantage. You might think you do. You might think your product is so amazing that people will just fall in love with it, and some will. But the trial, the purpose of the trial is for people to try out your product and make a decision. And you want to keep the time you give them to actually spend time with your product and then come to a conclusion and a decision. You want to keep that as short as possible. Uh, most products, you know, you probably could just do a one or two day trial because people will not spend 14 days of using your product every single day again and again. They will just usually sign up for the product, play around with it a little bit, then log out and forget about it. And maybe if you're lucky, they come back for a second time and play around with it for another hour or so, and then they make up their mind if they want it or not. So keep the trial short. From a sales perspective, the main benefit of having a short trial is that your sales cycle is decreasing. If you give people you know, 30 or 60 day or 90 day free trials, it's gonna take at least 90 days before you can actually close deals and make sales. Um, if you keep the trial short, which we recommend should be around 14 days for most products, um, what that means is that the user knows from the get-go that, okay, I have 14 days, I better play with the product and come to a conclusion soon. And from a sales perspective, for your team, your salespeople, it's going to allow them to be super focused and know, okay, every new sign-up that comes through the funnel, we have about 14 days where there's a decision point, either a yes or a no, either they upgrade or they don't. And during those 14 days, we're going to do X, Y, and Z in terms of activity from a sales perspective to help inspire and convince the, the trial user to become a customer. Um, to keep your trial short, keep them focused, and help people to make quick decisions for your product. The next thing you want to do is you want to use that trial period um, to actually communicate with your customer or with the trial users as many times as possible in order to upgrade them and make them customers. Um, the one thing that I, that I recommend you do, uh, one of the most crucial things, is to automate your email communication as, mu as much as possible. So what you want to do in an ideal scenario is you want a user, a trial user, to get multiple emails from you during their trial period. And that's not just one or two. I'm talking in a 14-day 14 14 trial, I would send um, users four to six emails. Um, you want to make sure that those emails are personal. So they don't just come from a no reply at email address, and they don't look like newsletters. It doesn't have to be HTML email. They don't have to have lots of graphics. Um, everything that looks very impersonal, very like, one to many, very marketing-ish, will get very low response rates. You want to send emails and automate your email process in a way where the emails come from a real person in the company. So it's, you know, in our case, it will be steli at clo.io. 
um, so that people can reply to that email. And it looks semi-personal, so I'm, it's you know it has my signature line. It, it, the email feels and looks and reads like it comes from a person because immediately your response rates and reply rates will go up. Um, you want to make sure that you communicate multiple times with your with your trial users because it's going to have a ton of benefits. Number one, it's going to activate those users. Most people sign up for a product uh, and never return to actually try it out or look at it, and they just forget about it. So you want to send a couple of emails just for the mere fact that you want to remind people that they should come back. Uh, the next thing is that you want people, you want to inspire and stimulate your trial users to actually communicate with you. Uh, the best way to do that in, an, in a scalable fashion is just to automate emails um, that that stimulate the, the the trial user to reply to that email and actually you know ask you a question or tell you why they signed up or schedule a time for a demo or a call um, anything that that stimulates engagement uh, and activation is is gold and will dramatically increase your sales um, uh, conversion rates for your trial users um, you so semi personal is one thing for automated email so you want all those emails to come from a you know, real email address. Um, you can do even some more gimmicky things. Some people decide to use kind of a send via my iPhone uh, footer to make it look even more real. Uh, we've tried that in the past for some startups and we saw that activation rates or reply rates go up dramatically. Uh, but it's not, you know, it's a, 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 you know, it's a borderline, you know, gray tactic. So some people will feel comfortable with it, so it won't. Um, you should use a drip or lifecycle email tools for that, customer.io or HubSpot. There's multiple solutions. Just pick one that works best for you. Pick a simple software tool that allows you to send, to write a couple of automated emails and send those emails based on certain events or activity for your trial users and send them through a personal email. So what I mean by that is that during the 14-day trial, there's multiple events where your user should be getting an email from you. Obviously, when they sign up, that's kind of like goes without saying, and most SaaS products actually do that. But most SaaS products end at that point. They just send a welcome email, and that's that. What you want to do is you want to send you know, multiple emails um, based on their actual activity. So some products, um, you know, it, with your product, you should know what is the number one activity that I want people to take. Is it you know, in, 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 you know, taking a JavaScript piece of code if it's an analytics SaaS product and putting that on their website? Is it actually uploading some contact forms or leads? Is it embedding something? There's certain activities that you know if users take them the early day of the trial, it means that they're going to be a lot more likely to buy the product and be engaged. So you could create a couple of automated emails when people take those actions to kind of congratulate them and guide them to what they should be doing next or send them an email if they're totally inactive. So if a Somebody signs up for a trial and within the first seven days, they don't log in again and they don't take any action. You could easily create an automated email that sends them, uh, um, that sends that specific user an email that says, hey, I just, I saw that you signed up seven days ago. I've seen that you didn't have a chance to really dive into the product. You know, here's like the two things that you could do today. Or, hey, I want to offer you a quick guided tour. Um, I can jump on a call with you for 10 minutes and give you a demo to kind of help you out and, and, and guide you through the product. Whatever it is, but you can send an email for people that are inactive. Um, and you definitely want to send an email uh, just before the trial ends. So I, I mentioned that, you know, in, mo in many cases, we would recommend people to have a 14-day trial for their SaaS product or a short trial. Um, we always send a, an automated email that comes from a sales rep, a personal sales rep that says, hey, your trial is about to end in two days. Um, we didn't have a chance to chat yet. Uh, you know, A, do you want me to extend your trial? Uh, B, is there anything I can do to help you? Do you want to jump on a, on a call? Um, and the response rates to those, especially to those like your trial is about to end emails, uh, the response rate and conversion rates there are massive. There's a ton of people that will reply and say, yeah, please, I just need a few more days. I didn't have enough time to check it out. I had this question. I didn't know how to do it. And that gives you plenty of opportunity to engage with those trial users and actually close them and make them customers for your product. Um, and you know, anything that I described actually focuses on the goal of creating a response from the other person. So you want to be really uh, call to action oriented. You want to um, end those emails with offering uh, a time to make a call or a demo or just asking them to reply and tell you how they heard about the product, what they like or dislike. Just always end your emails 
with a call to action. And, and those emails are going to be providing lots of activated and pre-qualified leads for your salespeople. Um, there's a ton more stuff that we could talk about, the, the whole like drip email, lifecycle email, to specifically with focus on the sales side. Um, but that's kind of to give you a, a quick and basic overview. So keep your trial short, send multiple emails during the trial to stimulate conversation and allow your, your sales process to, to kickstart there. Um, you also want to call everyone, especially in the early days. Um, but I, th there's no reason to ever stop, to be honest. But, you know, you want to call your sign-up users. That's one of the number one mistakes that most SaaS startups do in SaaS businesses, especially in the early stage, is they don't call their signups. They don't call their users. They don't call their customers. Um, let me give you a few reasons why you should. And I know that some people will go, well, we don't have the time. I don't want to ask people for their phone number because conversions will drop. Um, this is not scaling. You know, isn't it more beautiful if people just sign up for the product and then they just start paying me money? Yes. The answer is yes. But um, this is all about like what separates massively successful SaaS businesses from those who aren't. And in, in most cases, specifically and especially if you are doing SaaS for business customers, you want to call your customers. Um, and you want to call them as soon as possible. Um, and the reason why you want to call them as soon as possible is because one of the major wastes um, when it comes to calling customers or calling leads is that you're not going to reach the majority of people that you're calling. And that's why calling is, like has, well, that's one of the reasons why people don't like to, to call their users because you spend a lot of time listening to dial tones. You spend a lot of time getting to voicemails or having people not pick up. Um, a, a massive hack and, and a pro tip if you want to dramatically increase the, the actual reach rate is to call people within a very sh short window of them signing up for your product. So I'll give you an example. If somebody signs up for your product and you call them within the first five to seven days, you might on average actually just reach 20% of those people. You're ever going to only reach 20% of all those signups to even have a chance to talk to them. Now, if you call the same signups within five minutes, that conversion rate might go up to 40 or 50 or 60%. And the reasons are simple. I mean, when you call them within five minutes, you know a couple of things. Number one, you know that they're currently on there laptop, computer, you know that they're currently probably not in a meeting or on a call or doing something else because they just were spending time on your website. You know that they know who you are, what you're talking about when you call them because they just spent some time you know, deciding that they actually want to learn more about your product. So all these things you know, make your, your actual reach rates um, rocket up and, and that makes calling everyone a much you know, more successful endeavor. Now, when you call people for your SaaS product, um, especially trial users, it's going to have a bunch of benefits. Number one, activation rates, right? Um, there's so many times that we call people right after they sign up, and we, you know, the, the, the script there is simple. You just call and say, hey, you know, my name is Steli. I wanted to personally reach out, say hi. And, you know, I saw that you just signed up. Uh, I know that you didn't have a chance to play around with it a lot, but I wanted to see if there's any questions you have that I can answer and kind of give you any guidance I can to make sure that you're going to get the maximum out of your trial experience. People love that. They love it. We have customers that sign up and pay for the product. Um, and they tell us one of the main reasons why they decided to, to buy the product was because we personally reached out to them and we called them um, and nobody else did. Um, so you want to call and, and a lot of times people will have actual questions. They will say, yeah, well, um, I didn't have a chance to play with the product, but how does X, Y, and Z work. And those questions, you know, you, you being able to answer those questions in a personal and direct and quick manner will make such a dramatic difference in terms of how activated those customers are going to be. And giving them direction is also going to have like a, a massive benefit in terms of, you know, them actually using your product and trialing it out. Um, the other thing, the other benefit to calling your customers is that you're going to actually be able to qualify them. And what I mean by that is that not every person who signs up for your product should buy your product, is a real qualified buyer. And when you call them, you have the chance and opportunity to actually ask those trial users a few simple questions to determine if they are actual a qualified buyer. And that helps both parties. If somebody is qualified, it helps you in a multitude of ways. Number one is you can create them as a real opportunity in your pipeline and know that, hey, here's a, 
a lead that's actually a high quality and qualified and that I should be following up with. It's going to allow you to kind of build a pipeline and be able to forecast how many deals you should be able to close because you actually talk to your signups. So you have a much better understanding who they are. The next, the benefit if you disqualify somebody is that you don't waste time and you actually save them time and help them not waste theirs. You can easily tell them, listen, you know, now that I know these three things about your business, I can tell you that we're probably not going to be the right solution. Um, I just want to be respectful of your time. I mean, it's your choice, but what I would advise you is to go with a solution that's X, Y, and Z, and it's a better fit for you. You wouldn't believe what it does if you're that honest with people and actually tell them that your product is probably not the right fit. It's going to make them love you for that honesty. It's going to make them advocates of your product. You know, many, many times people have been recommended by leads and potential customers that we told they shouldn't buy our product. Um, people just love that, that level of honesty and authenticity. And the other thing is that you're going to avoid churn and customer support issues down the line where when bad customers sign up for your product, they're going to have questions that are a waste of time. They're going to have problems with your product that are a waste of time. And both parties, the customer as well as your business, are going to be bogged down by dealing with issues that you could have avoided if if you just spend a little bit of time actually qualifying your customers. Um, it's going to allow you, because you talk to people personally, to learn a ton of things and do real customer development. You're going to learn how they heard about you, what marketing channels are effective, uh, what problems they have, what needs they have, what other products they're, they're evaluating. There's a ton of things you can learn if you ask the right questions that you will never learn if you just send people emails or if you just you know, say, oh, we're a fully automated business, so the customers just interact with our product online and we never want to talk to them. Like, that's cool, but what that means is that you're going to have a huge amount of data and information and real knowledge about your market and customers that, you, that you're just missing out on. So just pure on the level of data and information and knowledge, it makes total sense to call your customers. And then, you know, last but not least, you, you know, when you have people on the phone, you're going to be able to manage some of their objections in a way that a, a automated product or email can never do. You know, some people will look at your product and misinterpret certain things or have concerns or have fears. You know, is this really secure? Are you a big enough business? Well, what if X, Y, and Z happens? You know, those concerns, those fears, you're losing these customers if you don't have them on the phone and you're able to personally relate and, and, and manage them and actually give them real answers in a human way, in a real way that will make them, will, will, that gives you a chance to actually convince them otherwise. So you're going to close a lot more deals. And you're going to be able to guide the buyer uh, all the way to the upgrade. Uh, you're going to learn, okay, what are the things that we need to accomplish with you during the trial period to actually help you become a customer? Um, so you should be calling everyone, every single sign-up. Um, let's talk about demos. So you know, you're, you're setting, sending your trial users multiple emails, um, you're calling them. Um, when it comes to now showing them the product and guiding them through the product, giving them a demo of your SaaS product, um, you want to keep it as quick and as short as possible. Um, you know, I've been, I've sat through hundreds of, of product demos. Um, many, you know, given by the founders, the CEOs, the VPs of sales, top-notch people. And the number one thing that all of them have in common is that most of them actually don't sell, and they're way too long, right? Most demos are around an hour. Um, the person takes about 40 minutes, 40 to 50 minutes to actually talk and show you all the little bells and whistles and all the features of the product, and then just gives you 10 minutes to ask questions. They're way too long. They're way too, too detail-oriented. Your demo shouldn't be more than 15 minutes. Um, so with demos, it's the same thing as with everything else. You want to qualify first. Don't waste your time giving people one-hour demos that can and should never buy your product. It's a total waste of time. I've seen this mistake done so many times that people spend hours and hours and hours demoing to people that can never buy the product. You know, and at the end of the demo, they ask, well, um, there's the one qualifying question. Well, you know, uh, are you looking, what do you think about the product? Do you want to make a buying decision? And the person says, well, no, I mean, we, we have still, we're still locked in on a contract with the current product that we're using. Uh, I'm just, I was just curious and wanted to look into this and we might buy this in 2014, right? So, you know, you wasted an hour, an hour and a half where you could have done something more productive. So you want to qualify people. You want to make sure it's worth their time and your time. You want to focus on benefits versus features. 
don't show them all the features and functionalities of your product. It's the number one mistake most SaaS businesses do when they demo their product. They just go through all the features that they have, just one by one. It's horrible. It's torture. Just stop wasting time. Ask a few questions. Hey, dear potential customer, what are the key features or the key things that you're looking for? And then show them how they're going to accomplish these goals with your product. Show them you know, two or three features and talk about the benefits and the, the features helping you solve real business problems problems and accomplish real business objectives versus actually going through, well, here's how you set up your account. Here's how you upload a picture. Here's how you do this little thing. Here's how you do that little thing. It's a waste of time. Nobody cares. And nobody can compute that amount of information after an hour. Like just wait an hour after your demo and ask that person to actually tell their colleague how your product works. And they're going to just repeat two or three things. They're not going to remember 30 features. So focus on what's relevant. And then Remember, just from a psychological point of view, that an, a product demo for a SaaS product is a sales activity and not a training or success activity. It's not about training them in every little feature and functionality so they become, they become proficient in it. It's about demonstrating value to them and showing them how this is actually something they desire and how this is actually going to address their needs. And then when you get them to get to the point where they're actually excited, you close the deal, you seal the deal, you turn them into a customer, and then you move them into the success and training part of the funnel. That's where you actually spend time training them and helping them become really successful with your product. But that doesn't come first. First, you demonstrate value, then you teach functionality. The next thing is like something that's like so misunderstood and so underrated that it's not even funny anymore. It's the whole concept of follow-up. So yes, now you've sent emails to your trial users, you call them, you talk to them, you demo your product. What now? Most SaaS businesses stop at that point. Like they just, they'll demo your product and they'll go, well, cool, uh, did you like the product? The potential customer says, yeah, yeah, it looks cool. Uh, you know, okay, so what happens next? Well, I'm gonna talk to a few of my colleagues and I'm gonna, you know, Take this for a spin, and then we'll decide if we want to upgrade or not. And that's where most people stop. Now, you know, some businesses, they'll send one or two follow-up emails. They'll, they'll send an email maybe a week later and say, hey, did you have a chance to actually show it to your, your team? Uh, what did you like? Are you guys planning to upgrade? Like, that's, that's cool. You did one follow-up, and that's actually even more than most businesses do. What I, would, what I want to tell you guys is that when it comes to follow-up, there's not a reason to ever stop until you actually get a result. And it doesn't matter what the result is. It doesn't matter if the result is a yes or a no. What matters is that you actually get results, that you don't leave any deal in the pipeline unresolved as like a, well, I demoed them, I spent a few hours answering all their questions, and this has been like three weeks and their trial ended, and I sent them one email and I haven't heard back, so I guess they are not interested. That guess is wrong. In many, many cases, most people don't like to follow up because they, you, you know, we don't want to be a pain in the ass. We don't want to spam people. We don't want to annoy people. Well, get over yourself. This is business. You know, I'm, I'm all for being polite. I'm all for being tactful. I wouldn't send a follow up email like 10 times a day. There's a method to this, right? You can send a follow up email every week, you know, and after four of those, you can start sending follow up emails every two weeks or every month. But you should never stop following up with people until you get a simple reply that just, hey, no, we're not interested at this point, or yes, we're interested. You can follow up by email or calling people, but you should always follow up. I can't tell you how many deals we've closed for our clients, we've closed for ourselves. I've seen other people close just because they followed up relentlessly. You know, 50% of the, the whole deal is just in the follow up and follow through. And most of the time, the reason why people don't reply to your follow-ups is not because they're not interested. It's because they're busy or because they haven't made a decision or because they don't know how to tell you what their decision was. It's for all these reasons that have nothing to do with them having decided that they never want to talk to you again, right? And I can't tell you how many times I follow up, three, four, five, six times, and then the person replied and said, I'm so glad that you follow up. Thank you. You know, I was so busy or it was really hard for us to get a decision or you know, with these kind of challenges, can we jump on a call and can I get you to talk to my CEO, to talk to this person internally? And then we jump on that call and we close that deal. It's all about the follow-up, 
never stop until you get a result, a yes or a no from a qualified lead. Okay. So uh, let's talk about some more tactical things in terms of how to make SaaS sales actually work. So if you have real salespeople, if you want to really drive revenue for your SaaS business with sales and a sales team, you need to set your prices right. Uh, and that's usually high, higher than you probably have them at this point. Um, you know, most SaaS businesses are way underpriced, and that's because most SaaS businesses were priced based on cost instead of based on value. So this is one of the main benefits of having real salespeople and calling people and sending them emails and actually, you know, communicating with your potential customers is that you have an opportunity to sell people on the value your product generates versus on the cost it might have. So, you know, when, when and, and for most SaaS products, your customer lifetime value needs to be above the $3,000 range, at least, ideally way above the $5,000 reach in order to make actually having real salespeople do sales economically work from a business model perspective. So if you're an end consumer SaaS product and you never want to call your customers or email them, you never want to actually sell them, then it doesn't matter. This, the prices might, might be low at the best and most optimal point. But if you actually sell to businesses and if you actually need a sales team to sell, your customer lifetime value needs to be high. Your prices should be higher. You should, you know, be able to have the, the lowest plan can't be a $9 or $10 plan. The highest plan that you have can't be a $50 or $100 plan per month. Sales and a sales team will never economically work for you. Make sure that your price is high enough and that you actually charge based on the value your product generates for that business. So how much money does it save them or how much money does it help them generate price set your price aside in order to have more success when it comes to sales um, and then get the cash as much as you can you know cash is king and cash was really crucial for a SaaS business um, especially when you look at it from a uh, from a sales compensation point of view so if you have salespeople, you have to compensate them Salespeople are expensive especially the good ones now SaaS is a beautiful thing because you get that beautiful, predictable, um, and repeatable subscription revenue. But SaaS is a problematic uh, thing from a, from a sales compensation point of view because, you're, yes, you closed a deal that might be worth $5,000 and your salesperson should get $500 or $1,000 in, in a bonus or a commission, but you're only getting $100 a month. So there's a huge cash flow issue and problem with that. Well, one way to mitigate that is to actually sell aggressively prepaid annual deals, a one-year or two-year deal, um, and make sure that, it's a, a, that, that your salespeople are incentivized to do that. Um, that's going to create all kinds of benefits. Number one, it's going to allow you to pay better commissions um, because you get the cash flow right up front. Um, so it's going to make the whole like sales economic part of your business work a lot better. Uh, the second thing is it's going to reduce churn, right? you you're helping your customers make a long-term commitment, which is a beautiful thing, making your business more predictable. It actually motivates your customers to go through any kind of problems they have and solve it and to actually adopt your product fully. Um, and it, you know, with that, it reduces your churn, uh, which is a critical point uh, for, for a SaaS business. So whenever you can, just aggressively sell on a prepaid plan for the customers where it makes sense. If you don't have a one-year and two-year prepaid deal or package, you're missing out on so much money and you're making it so much harder for your salespeople and your overall business to succeed. And then when it comes to discounts, um, you know, be really careful with that, especially again from a sales perspective. Um, only discount for annual prepaid customers. If somebody prepays for an entire year, give them a good discount. If they prepay for two years, give them an even better discount. But don't throw discounts left and right, you know, as if it's nothing. And that's something that salespeople actually like to do. So this is something that, you know, if you're a founder or a VP of sales or CEO, you need to take into consideration, you need to be really careful about this. Most salespeople want to close the deal. Whenever they get resistance, they're going to try to address that resistance in any way possible in order to close the deal. So if a customer says, well, your product is too expensive, a salesperson wants to say, all right, I'm going to give you a massive discount so I close the deal. It's just the way we are wired as salespeople. We just want so much to close the deal. So if you have a really loose discount policy, 
guess what's going to happen? All your customers are going to be getting massive discounts. Salespeople are going to be really not confident and going to have this weapon of, you know, giving massive discounts. I'm going to throw discounts away left and right, and they're going to preemptively offer discounts. I see this all day long where a, 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 a salesperson with a lack of confidence will preemptively offer a discount just to increase his or her chances to close the deal. They'll say, oh, you really like the product? Cool. Well, I can also offer you a massive discount. The customer never asked for a discount. It might be totally irrelevant to their buying decision. But what's going to happen if you discount massively is, number one, all your salespeople are going to start doing it everywhere. So by, de by default, you're actually decreasing your prices. The second thing that's going to uh, happen is that it's going to be much harder for you to predict customer lifetime value. It's going to make it much harder for you to actually manage your metrics and keep track of your funnels and predict future revenue because your, your salespeople are giving discounts randomly left and right and sometimes high and sometimes low. So, and the, 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 the other thing that's bad about this, being really aggressive about offering and giving discounts is that it communicates to your customer that your product is not really worth what your website and what your initial conversation told them to. And I just hate that perception. And the, the, from a sales perspective, what it means is that you're trying to actually close the deal based on pricing versus value. And that's just philosophically the absolute wrong approach. It's the best and most uh, the strongest sign of a weak sales process and it, a lack of confidence from a business perspective uh, to trying to close customers based on pricing. I can't tell you how many times we've gone through this experiment where uh, small or large customers will, will ask for discounts and will tell us, well, you know, I, we would buy this product but the price is way too high. And our response is way too high. All right, let's explore this really quick. Um, in Close.io's case, to just give a direct example, if somebody says the price is too high for Close.io, what we do is we just guide them through the process of what is a deal worth to you? Like if your sales team actually is able to close more deals, make more sales, what is that worth to you from a business perspective? How much money is a deal worth? Well, in most cases, a deal is worth multiple thousands of dollars for our customers. So you want to tell me that if you can close one or two more deals per salesperson because you have a much more powerful sales software, you know, generating tens and tens of thousands of dollars in, in, in increased value every month, but that's not worth $100 or $150 or $165 a month. It's absolutely worth it if you look at it from the value perspective. The other thing is that, you know, the, the, and, and I can't tell you how many times People have said we need a small, a, a lower price, otherwise we're not buying. And we tell them, hey, you can get a lower price if you prepay annually. And they say, no, we want an even lower price, otherwise we're not going to buy. And we tell them, listen, if right now is not the right time, if our product is not the right product for you, then you know, here's a few recommendations of cheaper options. If if in the next few months sales is a real priority and you want to create this kind of amount of value, then our product is the right priority. We'll leave it up to you. We wish you luck anyway. And like so many times, junior salespeople on our team will just feel like defeated after they send that email or they say that line because they feel like they are losing the deal. And I can't tell you how many times the, the customer comes back and says, all right, okay, we'll buy anyways. Like we just, two weeks ago, we had a massive customer, a company that you, all of you guys know, uh, a pretty big like technology business that was like going back and forth on us on pricing. And we just told them, this is the price. You know, if it's not the right fit for you, it's not the right fit for you. And they ended up buying. And they ended up respecting us a lot more for it. Um, and the last thing why you want to be really careful with discounts, beyond all the wrong signals it sends, all the problems it generates for your predictability and metrics and the funnel from a long-term perspective, and because it's like the, the secret super weapon of disruption for uh, um, incompetent and unconfident salespeople, is that you don't want buyers who only look at price. For most SaaS products, especially if you sell to businesses, you want customers that can afford your product and that are real, legit businesses and that want to buy something that's going to allow them to accomplish a goal and not just something that's the cheapest option out there. Uh, again, there, there are certain businesses out there that operate under, under a total different kind of paradigm of free and premium and super low cost and super low margin. And that's not who I'm talking to today. You know, who I'm talking to today is SaaS businesses that need sales teams and sales people and sales processes to succeed. If you're one of them, you want to have a really strict discount policy. And then last but not least, 
never close a bad deal. Um, you know, churn is really actually going to kill your business. It's going to make everything so hard. And that's, again, something where leadership needs to take control over the salespeople because salespeople inherently, it's in our DNA that we want to close every deal. And if we talk to somebody where it sounds like it's not really the perfect use case, but it's kind of a borderline and the person is really excited about it, so why not just let them buy the product? You want to be really strict and only sell into qualified customers and people who should not buy and who will likely cancel your product after a month or two, you want to stop from it. And now you might say, well, but why shouldn't we take their money? I mean, better take two months of payment than zero months of payment, right? Seems totally logical. Here's why it's going to destroy your business long term, your SaaS business long term. If you close deals that are bad deals and that have no chance of longevity, it's going to do a couple of things. Number one, these people are going to create a ton of support, training, and communication friction for your business. Those people are going to be calling you every day and having problems, questions. They're going to need to tell you how to do some certain basic things. They're actually going to create real cost in your day-to-day -day business and going to pollute you with lots and lots of emails and calls and communication. It's going to take away time from the real customers you should be pursuing. The other thing is that these people are ultimately going to be upset and unhappy and leaving your product. So you're generating, creating all these people that had bad experiences with your product and telling other people not to buy it even people and businesses that should buy your product. And it's going to mess up your metrics. You're never going to be able to have like a real idea on what your customer lifetime value is and how to spend money to actually acquire more customers. If, if, you know, if you're closing all these bad deals that pollute your metrics and, and distort them, and it's going to be like most SaaS businesses, if you're early stage, the first like few months, you're not going to have any churn problems and you're never going to think about churn. But once you get, actually get to a certain level of, of scale, once you have you know, hundreds and hundreds of customers, you're going to start seeing that churn is going to become a real issue. People canceling your product and it's going to become, it's one of the main strategic things that you need to focus on in order to build a massively successful SaaS business. It's really keeping a tap on our customers, well qualified, all the leads that we're getting high quality. Do we only clo close really good deals? And do we then take care of these people and train them, activate them, make sure that they're really successful with the product? Um, so never close a bad deal and make sure that your salespeople are incentivized not to close bad deals. Don't pay them commissions uh, and, and, and bonuses based on just the, the monthly deals they're closing. Make sure that the, they are getting you know, a small portion of that immediately, but a bigger portion of that based on how long customers stick around, how successful they are, if they're prepaid, or if they're monthly paid, like just make sure that all incentives are aligned and their salespeople only close high quality deals. All right. So that's it for the, the you know, few things that I wanted to share with you guys in terms of successful SaaS sales strategies and kind of the do, do's and don'ts. Um, so let's launch uh, into the Q&A section.